Okay, I think we are there. Uh, my clock says four o'clock, Central European time. So it's a real honor, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and dear friends, to wish you all a warm welcome to this UN General Assembly side event on CVID. As you all know, we should have been inside the UN building, but in a room not capable of holding uh, more than maybe 40, 50 people far less than what's currently online. So on one end, the pandemic has changed the way we meet and work, also for the better. Today, we will look at where we stand with the seaweed manifesto and the roadmap for safe and sustainable seaweed production. It's a part of our journey towards the 17 SDGs and seaweed is a crucial ingredient in that journey. Our speakers today are seaweed and policy experts that will share their views. But uh, what I'm also truly looking forward to is to meet producers and entrepreneurs. And today we will hear from people from all of the five continents. So that's really exciting. I'm glad to have you all here with us today. Last time we met, last time around was on Seaweed Day, as we informally call it yet, on June 4th. Uh, in that meeting, we ate, we drank and tested various seaweed products. It was great fun. I think we all had a good time. And we also learned that seaweed is a really good snack and a meal, but maybe not yet a good drink. Maybe though, some of you have a good stuff in the pipeline for us that we can try out later in other meetings. For this meeting, we tried and looked around to find some stuff to show you that is made by seaweed. And I'll show you what we tried to, I'll just share my screen here, one second. And again, welcome to the UN building. This is where we should have been, uh, but I think in the future we will all be always both live and physically meeting. But this was actually what we found online. It's a beautiful seaweed dress. It didn't fit me personally, but I'm sure next time we'll try to find maybe a t-shirt or shirt like this, my green shirt, which I'm wearing today, made of seaweed. It holds a, maybe a potential. I don't know if it lasts as long as plastic products. But there are also other scary stuff with seaweed that we see around. If you Google and you go to the street view in San Diego, you can actually see the sea monster, multiple images of it at the, uh, in the Google uh, Maps, Google Earth. Uh, and it's quite fun, actually. You can look around from ma many angles. And actually, this very summer, my son and I had a visit from this sea monster just outside our little summer place. You can see it's actually live and kicking there with his arm. And it was swimming all the way up to the shore with us. So seaweed can be dangerous, so look out. But it can also be good, it can be a good food. Uh, we tested out lot, lots of food last time. And I would say the, the Dutch people, they have managed to really produce something very interesting, the Dutch weed burger. I think it's only in Amsterdam where you can really find uh, something which is called weed burger, uh, trying to maybe uh, indulge your clients in uh, different kinds of expectations than seaweed. Next time I'm there, I'm gonna try it. Then of course, we know that uh, uh, seaweed can be used as feed, both for uh, stock and for fish uh, farming. We know it can propel airplanes, both small and large, and it can be used as medicine. Part of the, these are all the avenues going forward. And personally, I think CCS is a very interesting uh, topic of seaweed, of uh, carbon capture and storage. Let's see how we can do that in proper ways. Back to the UN, I'll go out of this screen. Let me just see how I do that. Um, uh, and uh, to get there, to go down this road in a sustainable and safe manner, uh, it's my very big pleasure to welcome my good colleague, Vincent Dumisel. I think you all know him very well. At the, he's our colleague at the UN Global Compact, but also working for the Lois Register Foundation. He will give us an, all an update on the road ahead. So Vincent, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Eric. It's always very hard to speak after you in a session. Uh, you may be the best Norwegian performer uh, since the band uh, uh, in the 80s, maybe. <laughs> uh, Runa Ray, who uh, designed the dress to make went specific for you, I'm sure it will fit you very well. <laughs> anyway, good afternoon, everyone. 
We are very, very glad to see so many people today for this session. So first of all, we would like to thank once again all the contributors and speakers for their support to this event and thank you all for attending. We would like also to thank the 250 plus organization of all size and from all over the world that sign up online for our manifesto. Back last June, the successful release of the Civil Manifesto clearly indicated some kind of momentum. Manifesto highlighted that macroalgae represent a massive and somehow untapped source of healthy local food, responsible feed, natural fertilizers, medicines, carbon sequestration, ecosystem services, alternative to plastic pa packaging, all of this while having a potential for cleaning the ocean, supporting life underwater, and providing jobs to the most vulnerable people in coastal communities. Was also voiced that seafood as a whole outperform on many metrics food production on land. Higher conversion rate, lower emission, no need for land, no fresh water, no deforestation, and so forth. When comparing seaweed to land crops and vegetables, we have to bear in mind that seaweeds are 1.5 billion years old on this planet. They were the first complex living organism. 10,000 types of seaweed gathered in three categories, green, red, brown seaweed. Half a billion years ago only, green seaweed moved on land. And over a million years of evolution led to all the vegetal diversity that we have today. So right now, a green seaweed is still genetically much closer to an oak tree or to a strawberry than to a brown seaweed. Green and brown seaweed are as different as fungi and mammals. That gives a perspective on the diversity and unexplored biological potential of seaweed. Think about it. At the very best, we have explored less than a third of the vegetal biodiversity of our planet. Still, our history has been entirely built on land production. And when it comes to seafood, we are in the Stone Age, hunting and gathering with low efficiency and without any concern for the ecosystem. Fishing will soon eradicate the last wild fish, while aquaculture is generally restricted to an, extract an extractive monoculture. Still, regenerative aquaculture could address some of the most critical concerns of our planet, such as hunger, poverty, pollution, global warming, biodiversity loss, and so forth. Seaweed is fundamental here. So why is it not happening? We highlighted in the manifesto various enablers. Seaweed production has no territorial limit relevant to national authorities. So countries and businesses now need to take action altogether and in a consistent way. This is the reason why being supported by United Nations Global Compact and FAO is so important to us. The lack of traditional food market for seaweed except in North Asia, is a concern, and we do need to advocate globally of the benef on the benefit of eating seaweed. We know for, from experience that in food trends are changing fast. Moreover, seaweed should be considered as a source of high-value functional food and bioproduct for humans, but also for animals and plants, as stated by Eric. And actually, out of the discussion we had, one of the major barriers we have identified for seaweed to take off is the lack of collaboration. The seaweed industry, and that will be illustrated later on, is very small, fragmented, disconnected, and highly competitive. The potential applications are exciting, but yet to be known. Research is spread all, over, all around the world, and everyone is competing for small funding from investors totally new to this concept. All of this prevents collaboration, and in any new and, and any new entrepreneur has to start on his own and from scratch, and that will be illustrated later on in the talks. Another major obstacle identified to build a global seaweed industry is the lack of global safety standard. Indeed, the complex patchwork of regulation often crushes ambition of any investor or any pioneering entrepreneur. Global safety standard is a must for any global market, but is still missing for seaweed. As a consequence, and because it is time for action, in order to address both the lack of collaboration and the lack of safety standards, the Lloyd Register Foundation is about to validate a multi-million grant in order to launch a global coalition supporting safety in the seaweed industry. Why safety? Because safety is a non-competitive topic. It can catalyze collaboration irrespective of the application of the seaweed. One may compete on quality, on efficiency, prices, or even sustainability, but no one competes on safety. Safety is a prerequisite and as such a convener for the entire industry. 
And by safety, we include three different notions. First is the product safety, food, feed, alternative packaging, and so forth. It needs to be safe. For example, there is today no global food safety regulation for seaweed. Every country has its own requirement. We should address this to make a, of seaweed a global market safe for every consumer. Secondly, we should focus on the safety of our environment. In order to preserve our biodiversity, secure both coastal communities and investors, as well as to ease spatial planning and license agreement, we should be able to demonstrate that any new seaweed cultivation is safe for the local ecosystem and for the livelihoods. Eventually, we also need to ensure safety of our operators, those who will work in new and sometimes difficult conditions. For example, we know that today most seaweed cultivation takes place in emerging countries and is done by men and women who generally, generally cannot swim. There is a need to create standards to protect them all. Lloyd Register Foundation will fund fundamental research by academics, as these standards should be built on scientific evidence. But the foundation should also fund this holistic global safe, safe seaweed platform. A world leading seaweed center with global network has been approached to help us deliver the coalition objective. When Global Compact is support and will support very actively the initiative, as well already a few of other partners amongst the manifesto community. Very soon, we will start working on the governance of this coalition. We will also invite all seaweed stakeholders to become, for free, active members. We want this coalition to be members driven. This platform should gather and share knowledge, map stakeholders, create technical working groups and develop partnership. We want this task force of seaweed representatives to advocate globally and speak with seaweed government, regulators, IGO, NGO, and large manufacturers. We need a coalition to support safety and education and improve skills all around the world, notably in emerging countries. We expect the coalition to generate more investment in scalable initiatives, leveraging on digital innovation. The coalition will welcome every existing platform and is not to compete or duplicate any ongoing effort. This coalition is one action amongst many others to enable the change. My colleagues over the next presentation will detail their specific and very complementary contributions and for some of them in a very practical way. Together, and it can only be together, we could be remembered as the first generation on this planet who has been able to leverage the ocean ecosystem to make the world a better place. It may sound optimistic, but we will all agree that we need optimism, hope in this difficult period. We need to build a new story for our next generation. We need to build a new restorative system enabling more social justice. For this, we need to investigate new directions. The seaweed revolution is full of hope and unexplored potential. Let's explore this hope. Let's be part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vincent. And um, I think we are all seaweed fans uh, in this group. And um, I think all of us see more than one solution for seaweed to be really accelerating the world towards the SDGs. I think collaboration is one of the key words that you said, Vincent, and I think uh, the coalition is a bold move going forward because we need everybody to take part. There's so much work to do, and we can actually be the first one doing this. So let's start with the UN perspective, and I would like to introduce Matthias Halvert from the Aquaculture Branch, the head at the Food and, uh, and Agriculture Organization at the United Nations, FAO, as it's better known as. You will tell us a little more about how seaweed can support new forms of aquaculture. Matthias, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eric. Can you hear me well? Yes, very good. Thank you. A very good day to all attending this important webinar. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to be with you today to share some thoughts and perspectives on the role of seaweeds for food security. And let me start by saying that seaweeds or marine macroalgae are a rather diverse group with some important common features and have great potential for food security and nutrition. And we use this one word, seaweeds, which actually represents many thousands of species and about 50 to 60 of them dominate commercial cultivation. So, how important is this group in terms of production volume and in terms of value? 
Well, our FAO latest available data show that over 32 million tons of seaweeds were harvested in 2018, valued at over 13 billion US dollars. And this production is almost exclusively from aquaculture. And in this regard, I would like to highlight two aspects. First, this represents a tripling of production from the roughly 10 million tons produced 20 years ago, okay? So it's a very solid and strong growth. Second, it's the rapid growth in the farming of tropical seaweed species like the Capophycus and the Yakuma species as raw material for carrageenan extraction that has been the major driver for the increase in the past decade. So today we will hear about the many uses of seaweeds, including as food ingredients, as feed or as fuel. However, seaweeds are more than just raw materials. Seaweeds are food for direct human consumption. And you demonstrated that very nicely at the last uh, event. Uh, for example, nori is used to wrap sushi. Japanese kelp is a popular snack in East Asia. And some species are used as a cooking ingredient to thicken soups or achieve special flavors. Now, food security, as coined by the World Food Summit almost a century ago, has an important nutritional dimension, calling for nutritious food that meets the dietary needs for an active and healthy life. And seaweed is particularly beneficial for those vulnerable parts of the society with special dietary needs. Because seaweeds are highly nutritious as they contain micronutrients, minerals, vitamins. In fact, they are the only non-fish sources of natural omega-3 long chain fatty acids. And seaweeds therefore occupy a special role in aquatic food system strategies especially when we talk about food systems transformation, as the inclusion of seaweeds in diets can help address the complex issues surrounding food insecurity, undernutrition, and also overweight, also termed as the triple burden of malnutrition. Now, when we think about the future and how to feed the world, many will agree that the increasing global population needs to source its food from the ocean. And seaweeds are uniquely positioned to help meet this need, whether they are grown alone or together with finfish and mollusks in integrated multitrophic systems. Now, of course, there are challenges and there are barriers, ranging from better communication and advocacy on using seaweed as food to improving and harmonizing regulations surrounding food safety standards that Vincent alluded to. From the FAO side, we have been active in promoting seaweed aquaculture for many decades and at different levels. At field level, we have facilitated community and experiential based learning approaches with examples from the Caribbean to Zanzibar and all the way to Southeast Asia where we have supported the so-called underwater farmer field schools. I take this opportunity to compliment our partners and my colleagues at FAO for some excellent work on socioeconomic aspects, on biosecurity on, and on aquatic genetic resources of seaweeds. Now a major part of FAO's work is at the international level and in fact FAO hosts the only intergovernmental forum where government representatives come together to discuss issues pertinent to aquaculture. Established in 2001 as the FAO Kofi Subcommittee on Aquaculture, just last year at its 10th session in Trondheim in Norway, we had a special event on seaweeds with seaweed experts from every region presenting their important work. As a result, our member countries unanimously expressed their interest in receiving more information on seaweed aquaculture in future sessions, which we intend to do starting with the next session in Mexico in 2021. And very briefly, I also anticipate seaweeds to feature strongly at the fourth global conference on aquaculture, Millennium Plus 20, which will be held in Shanghai, China, 
in September next year and is co-organized by FAO in NACA with the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Cooperatives in China. We can expect that such discussions at global level will further raise the profile and potential of seaweeds in the future. And all of this is to say that FAO recognizes the important contribution that seaweed makes to aquatic food systems and to the people. Bigger than just agar and carrageenan, seaweeds are a key component of aquaculture for food, and farming the ocean will be a big part of the answer for achieving food security and nutrition for all. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Uh, oops, there's an um, echo here. It's better. Thank you so much, Matthias. Uh, and I totally agree with you. It's a big industry already. It's big for people. It's big for the economy at this point. Moving forward, I think we need to make it big for the planet as well. Uh, and I think, as you say, uh, Shanghai meeting, very important to be there. And this is a follow up from this group meeting that we will do is to really target what are the main milestone uh, conferences taking place next year from COP26 to our ocean, the UN Ocean Conference and so forth. I think it's important we, that we as a group are able to lift this topic in these uh, formal and uh, other events uh, throughout the next uh, years to come. So thank you again. And by that, I'd like to introduce Flower Musoya, chairwoman of the Zanzibar Seaweed Cluster. You will tell us about how seaweed can support coastal communities and in emerging countries. So it's a good segue from Matthias. So please, Flower, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, can you all hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Now, uh, seaweeds, whether they are farmed or harvested for economic benefits, have been proven to be a livelihood enhancer in a number of emerging countries in Asia, Africa, uh, as well as America and South America and so on. And in many of these areas where seaweed is farmed, it employs a large number of farmers who benefit directly uh, from the seaweed industry, together with their families, uh, communities around them, including also service providers who provide service to the, to the farmers. In Tanzania, for example, the seaweed industry employs about 30,000 farmers, and these are only farmers. Now they are, they are families and communities around them and the, the industry is worth over 10 million US dollars. In the Zanzibar Islands of Tanzania, it is the largest industry in forex, I think. And it brings about uh, $8 million to the economy of Zanzibar. And the so seaweed contributes 7.6% in examples of success stories, farmers have become richer, their livelihoods improved, and their status in the communities changed to a better one. Farmers have cash from seaweed farming, which they utilize to improve their lives. They can buy, uh, they can build new houses, buy motorbikes, fishing boats for their families. Uh, so they are happy with the, the whole future to... of the industry. Farmers really need to be connected with it. Yes? We have some issues with the sound, so maybe if you turn off the camera, the uh, bandwidth will be better. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. Please continue. Okay. Okay. Um, so for, for, for um, a brighter future of the seaweed industry, farmers need to be connected with the researchers, with the government, with UN NGOs, business companies, you know, giving a farmer a chance to talk to a researcher or a person uh, when they need, gives them courage to continue working in the industry. Mm. It, important also research, uh, relevant research is very important to conduct re uh, relevant research and use the results of the research to enhance the seaweed industry. Research results, for example, 
of, from seaweed diseases, uh, resilience of the, the, the farmers, markets and policy issues can be very good stepping stones towards sustaining the, the seaweed industry. Now we see that methods that were used to, to, to produce seaweed before climate change are becoming less and less optimal. And so uh, climate smart innovative methods are very important to sustain the seaweed industry. Equally are the farmed species that before climate change came, they are disappearing in the farms and they actually also disappearing in the wild. In the wild, the seaweed species are also disappearing. So alternative species are important for farming to, to, to increase the production and also going into breeding studies, genetics to, to get better seed uh, for advancement of the seaweed industry. And now we look, we see that emerging countries, not many of them utilize their seaweed produce, especially in, in Africa. So they go to their seaweed, start processing to valorize their seaweed economy, useful for their people and useful for the, the country. And we see that youths are not much involved in seaweed farming. Uh, creating attractive environment uh, that will attract the youth to, to come to the industry is needed. If youths prefer to sell seaweed products, can also be brought in. All these will trigger the youth to join the industry, and we know that youth are the future of the seaweed industry. Uh, another point is that emerging countries, the people in their own countries know the benefits of the seaweed. Uh, the, the business people, countries around them, countries far away from them, do they know? So there's need to advertise their seaweed industries and make partnerships that will boost the seaweed industry. So uh, I finish up by saying that there is really still room to, to do more genetics, to do breeding, to get good seed that will, will be used to, to increase production of, of the seaweed in these emerging countries. Valorization, valorization, valorization is very crucial for the emerging countries to, to have these end products that are good and used for their own countries. And do all of this while at the same time biodiversity for our species. All this for the future of the seaweed industry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Flower. We had some issues uh, with the sound call today. Apologies for that. But I think you made some very important points. Is that, uh, and I think it's very relevant to this new age of digital collaboration. The barriers to enter the market should be much lower. The barrier to share insights and research should be much lower. And I think the coalition could have a fantastic starting point with taking your recommendations into account on that. It is today a small scale industry that is about to grow at an industrial scale. It's a huge opportunity for emerging countries to really take part in this journey. So thank you so much again, Flower. And now it's uh, time to pass the floor to you, Alexandra Costo. You're the CEO of Ocean 2050. And uh, you will tell us about how seaweed can be used for carbon sequestration and the restoration of ocean. So Alexandra, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. It's wonderful to join you today. Um, you know, it's funny when I think that I'm here talking about these issues with you, I never thought that this would be an issue that I would feel so passionate about. And yet seaweed has become really a focus for um, my advocacy and, and for our organizations. You know, uh, the way that I came to seaweed is, is that I've spent my life watching the oceans decline. You know, the past 40 or 50 years since my grandfather first explored the oceans, we've seen a 50% decline in the blue natural capital that our oceans possess, which means half of the whales and fish that swam in the oceans when my grandfather first started making his films have disappeared. And so against that backdrop, we've thought extensively at Oceans 2050 and just personally about what can we do that would help rebuild ocean abundance? so that my children aren't 
the generation of my family that will write the obituary for the ocean, but that over the course of their lifetime, they can see life come back to the ocean. And um, we've identified seaweed as one of those catalysts, one of those tremendously exciting opportunities for us to um, really find mechanisms to regenerate our ocean and bring back biodiversity. Mm. Um, Carlos Duarte, our chief scientific advisor, was the author of the recent um, article in Nature Magazine that showed that in one human generation, we can bring back abundance by 2050. And a huge part of that study was really looking at ocean forests. And the interesting thing is that um, when we look at seaweed aquaculture, it's an opportunity to expand ocean afforestation beyond their, their wild and natural footprint. So we started looking at ways that we can both support the amazing um, activities and projects and initi initiatives that already exist in the ocean space and in the seaweed space, and at the same time create um, public good that, that can help accelerate us into that more abundant future. And that's where we um, see a real role for seaweed. So um, Oceans 2050 is, is a, a campaign and action platform that's dedicated to this restoration of abundance. And one of our primary strategies is um, finding ways to, to address the blue carbon opportunity of seaweed aquaculture, both because of the restorative benefits that seaweed offers to the ocean, um, and also the benefits that they give to the climate by sequestering carbon. And so because seaweed aquaculture generates revenues that are independent of any carbon proceeds, it's one of the most scalable nature-based carbon solutions that we've found. And as a carbon solution, seaweed aquaculture becomes attractive when you compare it to other nature-based solutions because it has its own non-carbon revenue stream and because blue carbon credits sell at a significant premium to land-based credits. So if the seaweed aquaculture industry accelerates its growth rate to 25% per year through 2050, and current scientific estimates of macroalgae sequestration potential are proven, which we are, are um, helping to move along and I'll get that to that in a minute. But the carbon sequestration potential over the period of 2020 to 2050 is 10 gigatons, which is equivalent to China's estimated emissions in 2030. So that's significant. Um, and so our vision is to implement a step change in the scale up of seaweed aquaculture, which could then create the enabling conditions for millions of individuals around the world to become ocean farmers, to build profitable businesses, and also advance um, industrial seaweed farming that can ensure that the raw materials um, that we derive from seaweed are commoditized as inputs to animal feed and plastics, fuels, cosmetics, and other things. Um, so all of that sequesters gigatons of carbon, helping to restore the ocean and creating a regenerative blue economy to help feed and power the world in a new way. So we are um, working now on a carbon protocol um, and entering the phase of the project where we're doing the scientific validation and publication of results. So. Um, we are uh, with Carlos Duarte, Professor Carlos Duarte, um, looking at the past work that he's done, which has demonstrated the results of two algal farms, proving carbon sequestration in sediment. And now we're looking to validate those results at a larger scale. So Professor Duarte is currently leading an effort to mobilize a global network of seaweed scientists to sample sediments across seaweed farms around the world and to develop the solid empirical basis for the sequestration rates. And really exciting and inspiring to me about this project is that we are collecting samples from seaweed farms around the world. So China, Denmark, France, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Madagascar, Malaysia, Norway, and the US. And, uh, and one of those farms, the one in Japan, is actually a 300 year old farm. So um, I think another one is 200 years old. And then we have more recent farms as well. So it's really going to give us um, a richness of data and understanding that I think is going to advance this whole field uh, significantly. Mm -hmm. So once the data from the samplings has been analyzed and integrated, the scientists are going to prepare and submit a pre, uh, peer reviewed concept paper for publication, which um, will then allow us to 
uh, have approval by a carbon protocol certification organization, a methodology will be prepared and approved um, in the voluntary compliance market. And our goal is really to um, land this in the IPCC. So um, quickly, just some of the outcomes that we're hoping to achieve with this project is to really get a sense of um, how we quantify the role of seaweed farms in increasing carbon sequestration in the environment. There's huge opportunity and potential there um, to have you know, a big impact on, uh, on climate change and we want to advance that science. Um, and we also will then develop the voluntary carbon protocol that will allow for the issuance of carbon credits by seaweed farms. Um, and the longer term vision of that is to design and implement carbon credits at all eligible and willing seaweed farms. Um, and that will enable the monetization of the estimated 2.2 million tons of CO2 that they currently sequester annually. Um, and to then dramatically scale up the production of seaweed aquaculture. And finally, I think it's really important that we're able to encourage the spread of seaweed aquaculture as a carbon solution. Um, so that means and where we look at how to increase the social license to operate and um, accelerate efforts to optimize it for carbon absorption. You know, how do we make the first carbon, um, the, uh, the first carbon farm, like really um, do that in the scientific and then finally, and, and perhaps most importantly, how do we allow seaweed farmers to benefit financially from the impacts of their activities on the climate? And, and you know, switch the paradigm from you know, an exploitative blue economy. And I hear a lot of ministers and others talking about how the blue economy will be um, you know, pursued for sustainable exploitation. And I just honestly don't even know what that means. For me, the real opportunity here is to create a restorative and regenerative blue economy that can give us the industrial feedstock that we need for different industries and at the same time um, have uh, a net positive for the oceans and help us to rebuild them. And I think seaweed has a, 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 a real foundational role to play in that and it's tremendously exciting. So we will update you all on our, on our progress um, as we you know, move into the study with all of these different farms and um, are able to advance this science and really understand the carbon um, benefits of seaweed farms as we move to, to developing this voluntary carbon protocol. And I hope that everyone who is um, farming seaweed will be able to benefit from this public good and that we'll be able to accelerate and scale this industry. Um, for, for really, from my perspective, for the good of the oceans and the good of the communities that depend on the ocean and the good of our children. So that's, that's what we're up to. And that's how we see um, seaweed aquaculture and the blue, the, the blue carbon um, economy. Thank you. Super, Alexandra. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that was a, a depth dive into the potential of uh, carbon sequestration, but also the blue economy understanding that there is a real blue economy already taking place that should be credited. I think it's a very interesting point and we're looking forward to all the work you do and please share it with your peers in this group. I think that the Seaweed Coalition can play a very useful role in that important work you are doing. Uh, you know, mindful of the, what we're exploiting the sea and I think that goes uh, as a segue to our next speaker. And when I grew up in the 70s in Norway, the cheapest meat we ate was whale meat. Uh, and uh, now people are eating seaweed, fortunately. I think it's a good uh, swap there for sure. So please welcome uh, Paul Dobbins. He's the Senior Director of Impact Investing and Ecosystem Services at WWF. I think you can tell us a lot about the potential of uh, aquatic uh, farming and climate gains. Please, Paul. Well, thank you, Eric. And thank you, Vincent, for your efforts in, in bringing this group together. This is really exciting to see. Uh, many of the things I will talk about are, have already been uh, articulated and I'm sure the following speakers uh, will, will touch upon many of the same topics. And what this illustrates to me is that we're starting to coalesce around some key components that will help accelerate and advance the uh, seaweed farming initiatives around the world. So I, I came to WWF after spending a decade 
developing the first commercial kelp farms in the U.S. And that was a natural outgrowth of our shellfish operations. And that experience allowed me to observe firsthand some of the benefits that have been uh, described already and, and to really internalize uh, the tremendous opportunity that seaweed farming presents for our coastal communities, for our climate and for our food production systems. Our project at WWF is advancing aquaculture for climate gains. It is focused on seaweed farms for the ecosystem services provi they provide, the high yields of nutritious biomass produced with minimal inputs, and equally as important for the jobs they create in our coastal communities. And as, as we know, seaweed functions like a green plant, it absorbs or takes up uh, excess nutrients in the water, such as CO2, nitrogen and phosphorus, things we have too much of in our bays. And uh, at, in doing so, they become highly efficient food production systems. And if you look at uh, the UNFAO data and you extrapolate it out at the current trends, uh, there's an opportunity for seaweed just at its current uh, production growth rate to exceed that of potatoes, which I believe now is, is one of the, the top four crops uh, grown in terrestrial farming. And to do so, again, with minimal inputs and not using any terrestrial land to provide that highly nutritious biomass. Um, we're also seeing this trend ac across the globe in coastal communities. I saw it in my bays and uh, whether you're in the Gulf of Maine or you're in New Zealand or uh, the South Seas or in Europe, you're seeing fishermen in these coastal communities starting to become fishermen farmers. And this is really important for the growth of the industry and for the economic uh, development of these coastal communities that many of them are, are, um, are struggling with the lack of species diversification and their ability to continue on in the way they traditionally have worked on the water for generations. Uh, the objective of our project is to accelerate the growth of the seaweed industry beyond its current uh, average of 8% growth so that someday uh, the scale of farms will allow us to realize their ecosystem benefits and their harvest will contribute significantly to the world biomass supply. As part of our project, we're addressing barriers that we've identified of access to capital for early stage companies that are pioneering new technologies, processes, biology, products, or, or market development that will enable that scale to take place. We're uh, working on social license issues and, and several speakers prior to me spoke to that. Uh, social license, the ability to operate in our commons the oceans are the common wealth of all of us. And so it's important that society agrees that this should be done. And so our role is to help educate with the uh, science that has been developed and science that we are currently supporting around ecosystem services of farms uh, to make sure that uh, we're, we're contributing to the science and to the efforts to uh, minimize any chance of marine mammal entanglement, and uh, to help educate coastal communities as to the opportunities available to them uh, mm -hmm. were they to begin uh, farming. Um, and then importantly are the markets. Uh, without uh, faster development of the markets, uh, we won't see faster development of production. And so we've identified three areas to focus our efforts, animal feeds, uh, biodegradable bioplastics and uh, protein extracts from seaweeds. And we've started our work on, on animal feeds convening uh, people from across the supply chain so that we can have members of uh, consumer facing organizations actually have a chance to talk to seaweed farmers, to talk to dairy farmers, seaweed farmers can converse with the researchers that are doing the exciting research now on animal feeds from, uh, from seaweed biomass. And we think there's tremendous potential here. And many times when I talk to groups about that, they, they particularly in the Midwest that aren't in coastal communities, uh, they just can't believe that a cow will eat uh, seaweed. Uh, but if you live in coastal communities, and, and I live in one, 
uh, you know that not only cows, but deer and sheep, and uh, I've seen a raccoon, uh, the animals will eat seaweed. And the reason they're doing it is they're looking for that, those micronutrients that aren't available in their past of forage. And farmers from around the globe, going back generations, know this intuitively uh, and have observed animals doing this. And so uh, we think there's an opportunity to educate, support the research, and convene across the supply chain all of the different links that uh, will make up that success in, uh, in mainstreaming seaweed as an ingredient in, ma in manufactured animal feed. And then uh, for bioplastics, uh, uh, this is a very exciting trend, particularly uh, biodegradable bioplastics. Again, the feedstock, minimal inputs, uh, and doing positive ecosystem services at the same time. And then we've seen the rise of plant-based proteins uh, being used for, uh, for burgers and now uh, fish and, and other sub plant substitutes for animal-based proteins. And there's some really exciting work being done on extracting the proteins from uh, seaweed. And one of, the, one of the great benefits is these proteins come along with some other properties that make them very appealing to the organizations that are creating products around them, mm -hmm. uh, from clean labels to easier manufacture uh, to better taste. And so we think that that's uh, very exciting as well. Um, we have recently made our first equity investment in a seaweed farm, Ocean Rainforest, located in the Faroes. And we did so to, uh, to support them in their efforts to scale their farms for exposed ocean farming. Mm -hmm. They've developed a novel rig. The Faroes is located in the middle of the North Atlantic. Winters in the North Atlantic are an extremely high energy environment. And we're excited to see the development and scale of these rigs because that will open up more space uh, for farming in the future. Uh, and they also uh, sell a product into the uh, swine market that is reducing uh, piglet mortality and improving uh, animal health and productivity. We did so to signal to the market that we think these types of companies, these markets are really important to our future ability to improve the uh, the quality of the waters in the ocean and to be able to produce food with very few inputs. And we see the work of uh, many, uh, Vincent and Lloyd's Register, I was amazed at how quickly this came together. Again, it speaks to uh, a, a broad audience that is, that is really supportive of this type of work. And uh, we think that the Lloyd's Register and all of the partners that are associated with it will play an incredibly important role in helping these markets develop, which will then create the pull and allow greater scale of the seaweed industry. And so I'm very optimistic about the future and thank you for including me in this panel. Excellent, Paul. Very interesting. I think WWF equally plays a very important role in this with your research, your insights, and your communication skills. But also with bringing the F in WWF back on track, actually putting the fund part, investing in good solutions. Strong signal. I think the whole market is looking for those kinds of actions that you're taking there. So thank you again, Paul. That was uh, very useful. We are running quite tight on time, but uh, so luckily we have to go past five o'clock Central, uh, Central European time, because it's very important for us to hear from all the producers and entrepreneurs around there. We have representatives from all five continents here today. And um, I would like to start with you, Vivian Kinyaga, Managing Director of uh, Kelp Blue in Namibia. Vivian, this is a very interesting project. Please let us know what you're doing. Indeed, a very interesting project. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, we can already move to the second slide. That's how fast we have to move. <laughs> I will be sharing with you our work at Kelp Blue Namibia. We registered the company early this year in 2020, and we aim to contribute to ocean sustainability by growing giant kelp in the South Atlantic Ocean, just off the coast of Namibia. And we selected this unique ecosystem because of its um, high biological productivity, 
It's a nutrient-rich um, ecosystem because of the Benguela upwelling system. And um, at the same time, we also aim to harvest the kelp canopy for sustainable agri-foods, fertilizers, and textiles. Um, as I indicated, we only started our business this year, but we have a vision that by 2024, we will be, we will be growing 800 hectares of kelp forest. Next slide. And then with the next slide, I wanted to focus a little bit on what we have been doing this year. And I will start with the orange yellow circles on the bottom right hand side of the screen. Um, so mo one of the very first things that we did was to work on meeting the Namibian government requirements for us to be able to produce this giant kelp uh, in the Namibian waters. That required us to fulfill certain regulatory requirements, notably in terms of um, environmental management, to prove to the government that our initiative will not have any detrimental effects onto the ecosystem. At the same time, we also initiated um, the development framework for the company while we are working on the business for our venture. And then we spend a lot of time working on the biosystems. I think um, the four top um, circles there, that's basically from where we are sourcing the sporophylls from, how we will store them, establishing the seed bank, working on the requirements for the hatchery and so forth. And interestingly, relating to the previous presentations, we are also working on a research and monitoring plan in collaboration with universities, both locally here in our region, as well as internationally. So that is something very exciting and I look forward to collaborate further with WWF for, for instance on this. Um, our operations are unique in the sense that we are going to use artificial substrate offshore. And for that, we need robust engineering systems. And we are looking at, um, we, we are looking currently, we're spending a lot of time doing engineering modeling, looking at the substrate that we are going to use because if um, for those of you who might understand the Benguela upwelling system, it's um, characterized by very strong winds and tides, but we do have the advantage that our founder, Daniel Hoft, has spent 20 years working in the oil industry offshore. And with his experience, we are, we are actually able to work nicely on these um, engineering structures. Um, I also wanted to highlight that we are a slim team. The core team is comprised of about six people from Namibia, South Africa, and the Netherlands, but we have a huge um, collaborative um, network. In total, we are about people from seven countries, and it's, I think one of the things that we have really achieved this year is to bring together like-minded people who are interested in sustainability, but also coming from different fields. As I indicated, Daniel comes from the oil and gas industry. Myself, I have background in marine biology and we're working with um, researchers from various institutions also in biology. We have um, people like Caroline on our team who are on marketing. So we have a vast um, team. And then we are also collaborating with others that are already in the seaweed industry to learn from their experience, um, long-term experience. So in a nutshell, the year has been very exciting, um, especially as the team um, is gelling together. Then in the next slide, I wanted to share some of our challenges and lessons that we, we have to, learned. If you can make it very brief, Vivian, because we are running out of time here, so please. Okay, just quickly to address some of the key lessons that we've learned. I think the key important one is to deal with fear of the unknown. The venture that we are introducing, it's quite unique. It has never been done before. 
in as we were working on the environmental requirements there were lots of uncertainty for the people that we are interacting with so what was important then that we have learned here is the importance of um, scientific evidence and our collaboration with the universities has been able to give us that confidence um, as we dealt with this and then we also see ourselves as um, pioneers who then have to, for example, when it comes to the regulations as well, um, aquaculture regulations have not been developed for businesses such as ours. And this then requires um, learning um, and collaboration between government and industry, which is also quite something that's interesting that we have learned. I said we are a small uh, team uh, driving big results. And then the last one that I want to mention is that we did not expect that um, climate financing for innovative solutions such as ours will be this difficult to find and we think it should not be. So that's very my good. last slide. Thank um, you so I just much. Yeah. And, thank uh, you, thank so you so much. much for a very good presentation. Very interesting team and project and business that you have. Please use the Q&A, have a look at that. Lots of uh, discussions going on. Uh, Japan Hall is already suggesting sea with gin, beer and smoothies for the next meeting. Very good suggestion. Keep up the discussions. I'm now turning to Emilia Ducat and Mathilde Mann of Algolesco. Please share your views on the future of seaweed. Thank you. Uh, hi, hello everybody. So first we would like to thank you uh, for giving us the opportunity to share our experience today. Thank you. Uh, so I will go straight for it. Algolesco was created in 2013, actually, by local entrepreneurs and is built on private fundings. Our region also supported us in 2018 through an innovation program. We are based in Brittany, as you can see on the picture, on the French Atlantic coast. And the core of Algolesco is to own a marine territory of a large size, uh, foreseeing the growing needs of the market in macro algae. We aim to offer a premium product only with no cuts back on quality, and our foundation is built for a long-term vision. So an important information about our structure, today we own uh, 350 hectares of sea farm on Natura 2000, uh, Natura 2000 preserved sites where our seaweed benefit from pure waters. So next slide, please. Uh, our structure is based on uh, three activities. So first, the hatchery part, we master the seedling biology for the reproduction. So basically, we our genitor are caught directly on the natural habitats when they reach maturity. So after a few, uh, a short nursery phase, we can release them into their natural habitat again. Secondly, so the farming on harvest part. In fact, uh, our farm is located in a site very exposed to tough weather condition. So the farm infrastructure is thought to be respectful of our preserved site. Um, fi finally, the third activity is a pre-transformation of our seaweed range. So we are using techniques preserving the organoleptic quality of the product. So uh, as Mathilde just said, uh, the beauty of this model is that the genitor is naturally available in the local environment. It's a farming model without any input, without any fresh water, uh, offering us a crop loaded with precious minerals. So we can go to the next slide, please. So we currently grow Combo Royal on Wakame. Our seaweed grow on rocks on the surface of the water down to 1.5 meter deep, where the benefit of the sunlight. Um, the development of our seaweed is simply made by photosynthesis. Here, the stake is to master the transfer of plant nets from the nursery to seaside, monitoring the growth all along the season on harvest. Uh, so I'm going to give you a few numbers to illustrate the technical aspect. Uh, we have 3,000 boys on 40 kilometers of rocks, onshoring with uh, 400 moorings. Uh, we also have two boats. 
The deep of the water where our field is located is 20 meters deep uh, with a current speed of two knots. Uh, we are currently nine employees uh, for the production and administrative tasks. And in 2019 and again in 2020, we harvested 100 tons of uh, fresh seaweed. Our goal for 2021 is uh, to double the production and we are aiming at 500 tons uh, in two years. Uh, next slide, please. So about the range of products, what we do with the seaweed after the harvest, our first natural goal is to supply the food industry uh, with seaweed sold as a vegetable or a condiment, a bit in a um, traditional Asian diet, meaning including uh, seaweed in your normal and everyday diet. Um, uh, our seaweed are also uh, getting a lot of uh, demand for the molecule of interest uh, market, such as the extraction for cosmetic or uh, pharmaceutics, and these interests keep growing uh, constantly. So uh, our goal is to deliver a vegetal uh, biomass of high quality with clear traceability on large number. So we offer a few range of products for the food industry. Uh, first, we have the fresh seaweed, simply harvested, which is dedicated to our local partners in Brittany. Uh, they transform it themselves in snacks, uh, spreads, and various delicacies sold in supermarkets, for example. Then we have the fresh salted seaweed. Here we use the traditional Japanese technique to preserve uh, the product, uh, giving us beautiful results in terms of taste, texture, and color. We also have a frozen range, and finally we have the dry range. And we can find all those products in soups, uh, quiche, salads, vegan burgers, which are very trendy right now. Um, and we are going to go to the last slide, please. So to conclude, uh, a word about our ambition and challenges. Our ambition, we aim to be a major player in the European seaweed market, uh, delivering a healthy ingredient through an ethical production model um, to serve human nutrition, health, and well-being. So our main challenge is to stay pragmatic in our technical and biological choice, uh, which will allow us uh, long-term development. So we also need to create partnership with industrials and scientists from all sectors to speed up the development process. And the leverage we can use to achieve those goals, uh, it could be finding ambassadors to advert seaweed healthy benefits uh, through large advertisement on big medias. Uh, for example, talking about the eco-friendly aspect of seaweed farming or the healthy benefits of seaweed in your diet. The support of partners is very important for our long-term vision to spread uh, the goodness of our work and the goodness of our product to as many people as we can. And mm. we will conclude by saying that today our whole team at Algolesco is carried by the feeling that with our activity, uh, we are at the crossroad of important topics such as environment, nutrition and health. And we hope that with this short presentation, we have managed to share this uh, excitement with you. Thank you so much, Emily and Mathilde. And apologies to all of you that we're running a bit over time, uh, but this is so interesting to do these deep dives and to really understand the producers here. So now we're moving to the Americas uh, and we're now gonna hear, hear from Brent Smith is the co-founder of Greenway. Please, Brent, the floor is yours. Yeah, real honor, uh, real honor to be here. What an amazing, um, amazing lineup. I, I kind of feel like I don't belong here. I snuck in. Um, so I'm a, I'm a seaweed farmer and I want to talk about three things quickly. One is like, why does a fisherman become a seaweed farmer? What are the incentives? Talk a little bit about Greenwave and then some of our concerns in the, in the farming community <coughs> about the evolution of this. So, you know, I grew up in, a, in Newfoundland, Canada, commercial fisherman, uh, was in Alaska, uh, Gloucester, sort of fish the globe. But as we know, the industrial fishing um, uh, sort of destroyed that, that way of life for those of us on the water. So then I moved to aquaculture and that was salmon farming at the time. And this was basically taking all the mistakes of land-based 
farming and moving them out to the sea, right? So we moved there with hope, fishing, oh, here's the, we're gonna feed the world, we're gonna be on the front. And we found ourselves working for global companies destroying our oceans. So I kept, I kept looking and I ended up um, down in Long Island Sound. And the question became, what is unique about the ocean as an agricultural space? Like, let's ask the ocean, what does it make sense to grow? And you ask it, it says, why don't you grow things that don't swim away and you don't have to feed, right? And as soon as you get that mindset, um, things really open up. Um, so I moved to shellfish, but then I got hit by Sandy and Irene, like climate change suddenly comes in and destroys my farm. And I'm forced to pivot and use some of the great research and work of people all over the world um, and borrow that and start farming seaweed because it was a post hurricane crop. So this is a way to diversify work year round and work with the effects of climate change in my community, but grow the right species. So that's like sort of how we got here. The question is, will this economy keep me on the water? Will I want to keep doing this? Will I own my own boat, have my own small business, or is this going to be an economy that's unequal and doesn't weave justice into it? And then we're not going to grow. We're going to, um, uh, uh, we'll be pushed out of the industry. So we started Green Wave, which is a nonprofit here in the U.S. We work in Canada as well. And its role is really to train the next generation of ocean farmers. We've got two pieces of programming. One is training and education. The high touch program is targeted towards indigenous communities and fishermen directly affected by climate change. We just uh, successfully built the first indigenous owned seaweed hatchery in the country here. Think how important that is. The communities own their own sources um, of seed. The second piece of this training is an online platform. We have a waiting list of 6,000 people who want, who want our programming, so we need to go digital. So we're rolling out a toolkit, a farmer dashboard, so we're able to become precise and precision farmers, and a digital co-op so we can negotiate to protect our own interests. And I would just say, Vincent, I'm really excited about the safety piece, because as you know, I don't know, know how to swim as an authentic fisherman. So I'm excited, excited to read and learn or that part of the, the safety manual. Um, the, set, the other part of uh, Green Wave's uh, programming is innovation and we do restoration work. We just put in the first um, a commercial uh, farm in California with the Nature Conservancy to measure exactly what the cost per acre of restoration is of kelp. Um, we also do a lot of data harvesting, but making sure farmers get paid to harvest data. Like here's another crop, right? So the farm of the future is farming food, byproducts like bioplastics, fertilizers, farming data and farming ecosystem services. Um, just let me quickly go into my con the concerns because I think this is important. Like, are we gonna replicate the old extractive community where benefits are concentrated at the top and are not distributed through the community? Like that's what hmm. our experience through the industrial revolution. And so who's, who's going to farm and who's going to benefit? Like, are we just going to be wage workers working for companies on the boats? Or are we going to have our own small businesses? In the U.S., we're trending towards large companies, vertical integration where the companies own the seed, the processing, and the market, and are paying farmers poverty wages. That's where we're um, evolving to, and I think that's a, a serious, serious problem. And at the same time, there are so many sharks in the water promising huge things from an investment perspective. They're sustainable, they're gonna do all this stuff, but they are in climate denial, taking old business models and trying to apply them to the seaweed industry. I'm very concerned about that. Permitting, California just banned all new leases for shellfish and seaweed farmers, uh, uh, seaweed farms. They put a moratorium. That's a huge mm -hmm. issue. And then indigenous communities are very concerned whether this is gonna be the next white land grab. Like they, hmm. they're not given any right to farm right in front of their waters. So there's hmm. deep fear in there. And then just on the carbon market, like oh, there are all these brokers that are creating a supply chain of carbon offsets and credits, and they're gonna extract benefits along the way. And the whole incentive should be getting farmers to plant more crops. Like we're doing the work <laughs> yep. and the middlemen 
are like taking more and more of that slice. And I'm not sure that the pri private interests are the ones to do that. I think actually government should play that broker role because I don't, just like a, a, a hospital or a police department, I don't think that people should be taking profits from farmers actually doing their planting, but that's what you. So these concerns are like, we have to, what's so exciting to us in the US is we have a chance to do food right, do agriculture right, not privatize seeds, weave social justice. Like it's so exciting out on the water to build something from the bottom up. I just don't wanna lose that excitement and that, that momentum. So thanks so much. Well, Brian, thank you so much. I think you actually really point, had a very important point here is that when you get safe seaweed, you get global seaweed standards, you get regulations and certifications, you're professionalizing the industry. And where is the, uh, the small producers uh, in that picture? We always see the same as we've seen with the aquaculture farming in general and other industries. I think it's an extremely important point. You have to keep that on top of our mind on the road ahead so we don't end up like that uh, again. So for our last speaker from the continental search for uh, fantastic seaweed producers, it's uh, our next speaker is from Asia, from Malaysia. Uh, and it's Ma uh, Ms. Algeria Abdul. And thank you so much for taking the time again. Good to see you again, uh, Algeria. Please, the floor is yours. Hello, and a very good day, everyone. It is really exciting to share our important work with all of you. My name is Algeria Binti Abdul, a passionate marine biologist at Seedling, a biotechnology seaweed company from Malaysia. Coming from the coastal community, which mostly depending on the ocean resources, has always made the ocean environment to have a special place inside my heart. Coexisting for more than two decades is the playground and a memorable aspect of my life. Working and meeting like-minded people has deepened my resolve to bring changes to the community, especially the community that I have been growing up with. Coupled with my interest in marine biology, I can now pursue my, both my passion. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure most of us are aware that our ocean is in dire condition. So what are we doing to save it? Ask yourself. I'm sure in the past people know seaweed serve as a food for the coastal community and seen as an insignificant commodity. We work with seaweed called Kapapikas. It is a major industry throughout the Southeast Asia and the East Africa. However, it got a huge problem with the lack of good quality seed material, increasing diseases, reduced growth rate, increasing sensitivity to the changes of the ocean temperature and limited market opportunity. With all the problem, it has been ongoing for many, many years. We urgently need action and bring a new innovation. We should use seaweed as a solution to create more jobs and a reliable sources of income, especially for women. In seedling, we are creating seedling that can grow faster and more resistant to increase the productivity and the reliability of the seaweed farming. At the same time, we are developing a valuable natural seaweed extract for aquaculture and animal feed. To put it in a nutshell, we are really realizing the full potential of the seaweed because we honestly believe it, is, it can be a major world industry. It can feed the world and of course, restoring back our ocean. We, uh, for the conclusion, we at Seedling really welcome any interesting parties to collaborate with us 
for the advancement of the seaweed technology. I think that's all from me. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Alderia. Uh, great to talk to you again and a great project that you have. And I think we all share the same ambitions. It can really, I think we're all very passionate about this because we see the enormous change that seaweed can make for the environment, for the societies and the economy. So let's get this right. And to conclude on this, uh, it's good to have you, Vincent, uh, back uh, to give a summary of today's meeting. That's all, please. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Once again, it's, uh, well, it's, it's amazingly impressive. And the more I speak with all these people, all these pioneers in the seaweed industry, and I have so much respect for all of them, uh, the more enthusiast I feel. Uh, and, and there's so much thing to do with this beginning of a very, very long journey, I think. Um, we will need to be all together. I have not mentioned, but there were some other, <clears throat> a lot of other actions done by, uh, by the World Bank, by the Jeff, by some of other, uh, other people from the Seaweed Manifesto team. So there's a lot of things ongoing at the moment. Uh, we, we should be all together. We welcome any uh, new member. We would like to embrace as many people as we can in this seaweed industry. Once again, we are not in a competitive mode. So join us, uh, 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 join the seaweed revolution and, and, and let's bring hope again to this world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isana. Thank you everybody for taking part. Join the seaweed coalition, sign up and sign up for the UN Global Compact. It's uh, time to show that you're a responsible company. Looking forward to meet you again. We will have more meetings this fall. We will keep you posted. And thank you so much for taking part at this UN General Assembly side event. Bye-bye. Hi, thank you.